Today I'm really uh, pleased and excited to welcome uh, to my blog David Vandergrip. Now, David is a, uh, an attorney, an entrepreneur, a former tech executive, and a writer. And you probably have never heard his name. Uh, you may know David as the passive guy because he has a very popular and uh, well-traveled blog called The Passive Voice, and that's one of the things we're going to talk about today. So, hi, David. Welcome, and thank you very much for taking time out of your day. I'm sure you're pretty busy. It's great to talk to you, Joel. Uh, never too busy for you. <laughs> well, that's very nice. So, you know, you're. Uh, I, I want to get right into the whole thing about the blogging part of your, uh, your current activities, because I think that's really fascinating. As a blogger myself, you know, it's really interesting to see all the different ways that people c come up with to create blogs. And, uh, you know, there's certainly lots of different models. And, you know, I write about this stuff a lot. And um, you are a kind of a content curator, in a sense. So my question to you was, at the time you started the uh, Passive Voice, um, you were working as an attorney, yeah? Uh, I actually, uh, I actually, well, yeah, I was using my legal skills in a uh, with a company that I started and uh, and managed that acquired patents uh, and then uh, went through the process of licensing those patents and generating uh, patent royalties uh, from them. And so uh, I was not uh, formally practicing law at the time, but I was using my uh, my legal background with. Uh, with patent licensing and patent litigation. Okay, so because you were active legally, uh, you said on your blog, because uh, I was reading your about page, that you started uh, the blog anonymously and nobody knew who this guy was. You know, all of a sudden there was this like this person in the blogosphere talking about publishing contracts and the disruptive influences in the publishing industry and you know, he was just the passive guy, which is kind of a cool uh, nickname. And the passive voice is like a great brand. And uh, people got onto your blog really fast. They just loved it. And uh, you were posting a lot of stuff. So uh, it seemed like that influenced a lot of your traffic. And then it all changed. Like you went from being an anonymous blogger to uh, coming out. So why don't you tell us what happened there? Well, uh the, the the reason for the anonymity was, uh, as I think I mentioned at least in a, in a previous about page, is because I was uh, my company was involved in litigation. Uh, I didn't want to have wise guy comments that I made on the blog quoted back to me in depositions or if I was uh, if I was in court uh, testifying in patent litigation, uh, and so I wanted to keep keep a uh, a low profile so that. Uh, so that opposing counsel couldn't uh, easily connect me up with the passive voice via Google. As I say, I uh, just trying to anticipate. I've done a lot of litigation previously, and uh, that's what I would have done if uh, if uh, if I were the other side. And so I tried to make it a little more difficult for them to uh, to find my uh, my alter ego on the passive voice. Yeah, Google has many uses, doesn't it? It does. It does. There are fewer secrets than there used to be. So I think you referred to those as snarky comments. And, um, you know, obviously, uh, in your blogging style, where you're reposting uh, pieces from other people's articles and then sometimes commenting on them, I mean, a lot of people started reading your blog, I think, because of those snarky comments. That was like a, a big attraction. Well, let's see what the passive guy has to say about this. <laughs> yeah, right. And, well, uh, it's uh, it's fun to do. And I certainly there are... In the in today's publishing and self-publishing world, there are plenty of uh, plenty of people and organizations that are deserving of a little snark uh, from time to time. I believe. So there you were doing uh, patent litigation, and obviously you have a big background in intellectual property law. So, mm -hmm. But you started a blog about the publishing business specifically. So uh, how did that happen? I mean, have, were you, have you ever published? Are you a published author? I mean, what what was it about the publishing industry that attracted you? Because it seems like from your background, you could have gone in several different directions. Well, I uh, I, I am a published author. Uh, nothing nothing uh, very big or profitable or significant, I don't think. But uh, my wife has also uh, been an author for quite a number of years. 
And uh, I started, you know, as, as with many authors, uh, she was disappointed with the direction her royalties were going. And so I started doing a little bit of looking into self-publishing, uh, decided to, uh, to blog about it, uh, uh, was able to negotiate with, uh, with my wife's publishers, a return of rights for, uh, for several of her books. And the, the passive voice was really sort of my way of blogging about what I was discovering uh, about self-publishing. And I didn't find right away, I didn't find a lot of places that really talked about it uh, in the way, you know, talked about the things that I was interested in. And then uh, because I'm a lawyer and because, uh, you know, the, the contracts between publishers and authors are so, uh, let's say, interesting, <laughs> uh, Byzantine, maybe. Uh, I sort of, I sort of uh, gravitated into occasionally talking about publishing contracts and contract clauses and problems with contract clauses and then discussing some litigation that's that's going on in the publishing world from time to time as well. So, in fact, just to continue on that, I mean, you have been collecting contracts. I mean, you have a contract yeah. collection service uh, where you uh, accept contracts, you uh, kind of treat them anonymously so people aren't identified with whose contracts they are. Are you amassing a pretty big uh, collection of contracts that way? Or are people sending you contracts? Uh, yes, people are sending me contracts, and one of the reasons I, I started the contract collection is, uh, as I got into this, the the way I learn about a, an industry, and I've I've written contracts and negotiated contracts for a lot of different industries uh, in my in my legal and business career. Uh, the way you learn about you know sort of how things are done is you try to see a, a lot of existing contracts, and you get a sense of the way people like to do things, you get a sense of how people like to hide uh, gotchas, uh, and so from that standpoint, it was uh, you know that that was the reason I tried to uh, tried to collect contracts is it it gave me an ability to uh, fairly quickly understand how you know how publishers uh, and agents uh, structured their contracts uh, where they. Where they tried to gain advantages, uh, where they where they did try to hide some things that uh, that some authors uh, are not likely to see. Well, it seems like probably the big change lately is all the e-publishing rights, digital rights. You know, and I remember I had a publishing company, a small publishing company, years ago, and you know, all of those rights were really almost kind of like afterthoughts. Nobody really cared. I mean, there were some CD-ROM products, but basically, you know, nobody was doing anything with them. So it was very much an afterthought. Sometimes they were added into the contract. Sometimes they weren't. They just weren't even in there at all. So right. I assume that's like a big focus of the change that's going on now because obviously eventually publishers did wake up to the fact that there was something valuable there. Yeah, that's exactly right, and and in, in any business contract, you pay most attention to the to the things that are going to generate dollars uh, or other benefits to you uh, for the contract. And when print was ninety nine point nine percent of all uh, all revenues uh, for for book sales, uh, then author uh, publishers didn't pay much attention to uh, ebook rights, and then they. Uh, when, as ebooks became more important, sort of structurally, and again, I've I've dealt with enough contracts uh, over the years to kind of get a pretty good idea of how things operate mm -hmm. uh, and how contracts are modified over time. And initially, there were quite a few publishers that sort of just tacked on ebook rights without thinking much about how those rights and those contract clauses would interact with other clauses in the contract. And so, uh, and then, uh, of course, as as ebooks have become more and more of a of a significant profit center, then it's been interesting to see the the publishers' contracts evolve over time, uh, so that you know the contracts that that my clients are getting today are substantially different in terms of ebook rights in many cases than they than the same publisher was was uh, proposing a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, that is uh, not surprising somehow, and um, 
you know, it seems like that, uh, you know, I don't get into those areas very much because I kind of tr tend to stay on the indie side of the world. Right. Uh, just that's that's my niche. And um, But it does seem like there, for people signing contracts like that, they have to be very concerned with uh, the possible uh, scenarios under which those rights will revert back to them at some time because it's a whole different world. You know, it was very easy to know if your book was out of print in the old days because it just was out of print and now it's all uh, quite a bit more amorphous I mean when does a print-on-demand book actually go out of print you know it's realistically in the real world it's never out of print so you have to have some other kind of criteria and the same could be said for ebooks too so I assume that there's been a lot of evolution from both sides of that equation on how to deal with a uh, reversion of rights particularly yeah, you're right. You're correct on that. And basically, the the reversion of rights or out of print clauses that that most publishers are proposing uh, in their standard contracts are essentially never out of print clauses. Yeah. Uh, it's the only way under the standard forms that the author will ever uh, receive rights back uh, under these under these clauses and, the, and clauses. And they're very complex and they're very obscure and so forth, but the only way that the, that the author is ever going to receive rights back under these clauses in their standard form is if the publisher decides it wants to give the rights back. Well, something to watch out for for all those people who are thinking about, uh, you know, their dream is to sign a contract with a major publisher. Right. You know, maybe it's a good idea. Not, maybe not a good idea for everybody. You know, authors are different. Everybody, mm -hmm. you know, you can't sort <clears throat> sort of say, all right, well, this is the cookie cutter uh, thing that every author ought to do because authors are different. And uh, uh, even though uh, I find a lot of things to like about indie publishing, there are also some very, very strong benefits to a well-crafted uh, relationship with a, uh, a big publisher, depending upon the author, depending upon the property. And so it's not, you know, it's for me, it's not a religious war it's just strictly pragmatically, what is best for the author today? Does the author care care more about today or this year or next year than the author cares about 20 years from now? Mm -hmm. If so, then, uh, then the long-term commitments that are involved in traditional publishing contracts may not bother uh, one author. On the other hand, for Another, it may be something that's really significant. So you can't uh, you can't say there's a one size fits all solution uh, for authors these days. Sure, and books themselves are very different. Authors are very different, and then the publishing circumstances are you know really unknown until you publish the book. And you know I'm not, yep. as you know, I'm totally uninterested in the religious wars. It means nothing to me because to me every book is unique and each author's situation is unique and there are times when really the best thing would be to try to get an agent and get a publishing contract yeah. because that's yeah, really yeah, going to yeah. be optimum for that situation so uh, I don't see anything wrong with that I mean you know most of the great books we've read in our lives were published by traditional publishers and continue to be so there's no uh, I don't have any problem with that at all but I'm very glad as somebody who's been involved in self-publishing for many many years to see that there are more talented writers going the indie route, and I think that's going to really invigorating the publishing business at a time of tremendous turmoil. But I want to get back to your blog because I'm really interested <laughs> in the blog. Okay. And um, you know, I wonder if you had a model in mind, or if there was how uh, for the kind of curated content, because there are two things that really seem to typify what you do. One is. Um, the curation itself, finding interesting stuff, and mm -hmm. you know, sometimes commenting on it, um, amplifying the discussion, and then the other thing is the volume because you post many, many articles a day. So, mm -hmm. and that kind of goes together. I've seen other blogs that are similar, where if you're curating content, then you can actually, you know, if you had to write a thousand-word article, obviously you're not going to do too many of those in a day, are you? Right. So I wonder if you had a model or or why you decided to do that particular kind of blog. Um, not really a model. Basically, the passive voice uh, is is sort of a reflection of what I'm seeing and reading. Uh, in the process of keeping up with what's going on with uh, with publishing, uh, both traditional and self-publishing, uh, as I go through the day, I've got 
I follow a zillion uh, a zillion blogs with a uh, with a feed reader, including yours, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, and then I probably have fifty to sixty uh, Google alerts that are set up for particular phrases or uh, subjects that I I'm interested in, and I just I comb through, uh, and, and at least for me, I'm able to do so fairly quickly. I comb through a, a, a big selection of information uh, every day, just looking for tidbits that are important to me. And if I think they're important to me, then uh, they or, or interesting to me, then I think uh, they may be interesting to uh, to other people that are involved in the uh, in the uh, publishing industry or the self publishing industry. So it's sort of like one of those. Uh, one of those big uh, whales that uh, swims around and takes in, uh, you know, millions of gallons of water all day just to strain out some algae uh, that uh, that sustains them. And I'm I'm sort of like one of those whales uh, with information. An information whale. That's a, an information whale. That's right. That's a, a great image right there. So, um, yeah, it's interesting because uh, you know. Part of um, you know blogging strategy for a lot of people who are blogging with some kind of intent, you know, is uh, posting more often is typically a way to um, gain traffic, mm -hmm. and um, so you know your traffic uh, obviously has been going up, 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 and uh, your subscribers and I noticed you're uh, really gathering a lot of a huge uh, tribe on Twitter. Mm -hmm. uh, last time I checked, I think you had about twenty three thousand followers there. And uh, do you um, do you auto post your your blog post through to your Twitter account? Yeah, I do. Uh -huh. They they automatically uh, connect up with Twitter. And it's kind of interesting that you mentioned Twitter because I was a giant Twitter skeptic, and uh -huh. I like you know like a lot of you know sort of uh, tech geek types. As soon as it as soon as they opened it up, I I signed up. I went on and I said, ah, this is a waste of time. But, uh, and I'm still, I, you know, the, Twitter is something, I've got some, some uh, a bunch of Twitter people that I follow that's another, that are another source of potential uh, blog posts as well. But it's, um, uh, I'm still not a giant fan of sort of sitting down and reading Twitter, mm -hmm. but I get uh, roughly 25% of my daily uh, hits on my website come uh, when people click on Twitter links. And so from the standpoint of just making it available, getting it out so that people discover the blog, uh, Twitter is Im important. And I know some of the, some of the people that, that are regular visitors uh, to the blog and regular commenters on the blog, uh, you know, come in via Twitter. They just, you know, they watch the Twitter stream and if they see something that's interesting, they, they, uh, they click on it and they enter the blog that way. Yeah, and I could certainly uh, attest to that myself. I mean, I've been very active on Twitter the last couple of years, and uh, Twitter is, uh, you know, it kind of is a chicken and egg thing. I mean, I do it because I, I really enjoy Twitter, and I used it extensively because I find it a really great way to meet people make that uh -huh. initial contact with somebody that mm -hmm. and look I've met people and developed relationships and friendships with people on Twitter I mean I could have called them on the phone uh, two years ago they wouldn't have even taken my call but you right. know, on Twitter it's a whole different world so I love that right. part of Twitter and gotcha. yeah Twitter is the second biggest source of traffic on my blog as well and I think it's uh, you know basically the same reason uh, although I think, uh, you know, I like the back and forth more. There's a conversational element that you can get into that's really kind of fun. But, you know, I, I looking at the passive voice as a blog, I mean, you look at a lot of blogs. I look at a lot of blogs. I mean, obviously it's a blog run by somebody who just really enjoys what they're doing. Mm -hmm. I think that comes through pretty clearly. You're very involved with your community, mm -hmm. um, you know, and uh, you, you have a active community. I mean, I've had the occasion of where you've posted part uh, a link to one of my posts, mm -hmm. and I'll go over there, and you've got twice as many comments on your version as what I've got on the original. So uh, right. that's really kind of interesting phenomenon, and uh, what do you think about that? Well, I, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. Sometimes, once in a while, and it's, I think, out of uh, I think I'm up over, or I no, don't think I, I'm up over, well up over 3,000 posts now that I've made. And I, every once in a while, I'll get, I, I think, three or four times 
somebody has said, why, you know, why didn't you just post a link to my blog rather than, you know, pulling out an, you know, pulling out an excerpt or something like that. And uh, it, it sort of reflects the way that I do things. And I need a reason to go click, go to some, some new place I haven't been before. I mean, there are, you know, it's, it's uh, like the old Naked City uh, uh, TV shows, you know, there are millions, you know, million stories in the Naked City, and this is one. There are a million blogs that uh, that uh, you know, I you know, I I see links to from time to time, and I only go to a few. And so, um, my idea is okay. I post an I post an excerpt there so that people who come to my blog can say, oh, that's interesting. Uh, I'm gonna you know, I'm gonna go check it out. Or no, I'm not interested in that at all. Whereas if I just if I just mention you know mentioned a link. You know, like say uh, Glenn Reynolds does on Instapundit, and I'm mm -hmm. a I'm a big fan of the way he blogs. But I don't. I end up going to clicking through on a lot of links that are not not you know on, off of Instapundit that are not that interesting to me. And so my style is to tell people a little bit about it, and that may be all they need to know, or that may they may not be interested at all. And then, if they are interested, they click through and can dig deeper into uh, into the blog. And uh, I get a lot of people who say, you know, I couldn't fit. You know, my my traffic went up through the roof today. I couldn't figure out what was going on, and then I found <laughs> out, you know, I found out you linked there. And uh, and it's uh, so it's you know it, it, it's a balance there. And uh, and hopefully the the uh, uh, you know the blogs that I you know that I link to and I talk about. Uh, uh, get traffic and get a lot of regular visitors uh, after people see see that uh, the blogger is doing good you know doing good things and has interesting thoughts and so forth. Yeah, and I think that the way you do it, David, is really very effective because you know you're not just pulling, let's say, the first sentence out of the post, right. uh, or you're not just putting in just a link. Nothing against Instapundit; that's a different kind of service, mm -hmm. but. It's obvious that you've looked at it and pulled out the part that was interesting to you, and you know yeah, whether that's you exactly right. common or yeah. not. So, I mean, anybody can see that, and that means that you're dealing with an intelligence behind the, you know, the blog, and that, of course, is very attractive to people. And I think also the the um, the general atmosphere on the passive voice promotes discussion. So yeah. and and that goes down to your ability to uh, both present content and moderate it. So I think that's I think it works really well. I I'm always pleased as punch when I see you've uh, linked to one of my articles. I have no problem at all, and it's partly because of the way you do it because you can get a paragraph or two paragraphs. But if you really if they like it, then obviously yeah. you're going to click that link and go through. Yeah, and that's uh, I'm, I'm I, you know you do you do great blogs and yours is one of the one of the ones that I appreciate the most and uh, and so uh, you know I'm glad I'm glad that you feel like it's uh, it works for you as well as for the the people who come to the passive voice. Oh hey, listen, I'm in the uh, I'm, I have the marketing uh, 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 mantra, you know, you are everywhere. So I mean, I'm, <laughs> right, I'm, I'm spread I, a lot of places, and uh, you know that's very intentional on my part. So I don't mind at all. Now, the other thing that's interesting to me about the passive voice is it really uh, comes across as a very personal uh, enterprise. In other words, you have uh, no advertising on your blog. Right. Um, you don't have, uh, it doesn't seem like you have any affiliate stuff going on, and uh, you don't have an email sign up. So, I mean, you have email subscriptions, but right. you don't have an opt-in. But that's just feed burner, yeah. E you don't have an opt-in for an email list. Now, those are the right. three things that say to me when I'm looking at a blog, you know, somebody's trying to monetize what they're doing mm -hmm. or develop some product line or whatever it is. And um, your blog has none of those. So th is that a conscious choice on your part? Yeah, it is. I... Uh in, in terms of in terms of sort of you know monetary benefits to me uh, since I've started uh, I reactivated my bar membership and have started practicing law uh, I I receive a fair number of uh, people who contact me for legal services that say hey I, I saw your blog uh, you know others say you know I I talked you know I was at a writers conference and so and so you know, talked about you or something like that. And so that's from the, from the monetization standpoint, uh, that's really, uh, that's really the only benefit that I'm, uh, 
I'm uh, looking for uh, out of the blog. One of the one of the big benefits for me is just you know as I've as I've said a couple of times, actually more than a couple of times on the blog, the best part of it for me is the comments. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of really smart people who who uh, share some good comments, and I learn things uh, you know about what's going on in the business. Uh, in some some cases, we you know I have some very uh, experienced authors uh, who are commenters, and they provide context for you know okay, well this is what you know this is what the situation was 20 years ago uh, when I started writing, and this is how it's changed and so forth. And so the fact that uh, that smart people uh, leave comments and in sometimes sometimes very detailed comments is one of the great benefits for me about having a blog. Well, uh, I have to agree. You've got great commenters and a great community. And I know from my point, I mean, I, I love that about blogging also. I mean, that's really where the juice is for me. And then these, you get these conversations that start up in the comments and it just, right. it's, it's really uh, kind of neat. Well, that's a great segue though into the publishing business. Now we've all been kind of like riding this uh, wave of disruption in the last few years. And uh, it doesn't seem to be slowing down. I mean, uh, you know, formats are proliferating. Uh, nobody really knows, in my way of thinking, exactly what an ebook is yet. You know, we're certainly selling millions of them now, but, uh, you know, it's just basically a text dump from a printed book, most of them, or from a manuscript. There's lots of people trying to extend ebooks in different directions with media or geolocation stuff or you know, personalization or the social reading phenomena. That was supposed to be a big thing. I, I haven't seen that happening yet. Right. So I'm curious from where you're sitting because you have a kind of a unique perspective in that, you know, you have this whole uh, intellectual property background. You're a writer, your wife's a published author, and you monitor kind of both the traditional and the indie side. So mm -hmm. I'm curious, uh, you know, mostly about the e-publishing revolution. I mean, what do you see from where you're sitting? I mean, we're in a very interesting place right now, I think. Um, well, let me give you a little uh, a little context, because I've seen this happen before. Uh -huh. uh, a few years ago, actually, actually, no, more than a few years ago, I worked for a company called LexisNexis, which uh, provides, uh, he, provide dead and provides huge databases, professional databases for lawyers uh, and on the Nexus side for business researchers and lobbyists and all kinds of different people. And uh, LexisNexis uh, is owned by Reed Elsevier, which is a huge, uh, enormous worldwide publisher. And when I worked there, I saw a, a number of years ago, I saw the whole legal publishing world, which was uh, uh, sort of invisible to anybody who wasn't a lawyer, but was an extremely profitable business to be in. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw it get destroyed by online access. Mm -hmm. So uh, there, um, there was a uh, publication called, well, still is a publication called Martindale Hubble, which is basically a paid directory uh, for for lawyers, so if you wanted to wanted to find a lawyer in Denver, mm -hmm. uh, one one good place that you might and you didn't know anybody there, didn't know any other lawyers there to ask for references, you'd open up Martindale Hubble and you know read about various attorneys that that practiced in a particular in a particular area, and and Martindale was a big thick book. I mean, it was it was at least eight to ten inches thick. It weighed a ton. And you, you know, basic uh, uh, information or basic information about an attorney was free. If you wanted, if you wanted to pay for that, you could get an expanded listing, and um, almost every big firm paid for it, and so forth. That was an immense. That was owned by LexisNexis, mm -hmm. uh, that, that the book business. That was an extremely profitable business. Mm -hmm. The uh, the margins on that. Uh, back in the day were well over 50%, 50 percent, wow. 50 to 60 percent, because all you did is collected the information that other people, you know, made available and printed it. Uh, well, I saw that business get destroyed by online legal directories. And, you know, there were people that said, 
you know, lawyers are never going to give up books. You know, mm-hmm. you go to any law office, uh, you know, and you see row after row. Yeah, of books. That library, right? Yeah, yeah. you know, I mean, that was part of what uh, what made you look professional is if you had a bunch of books uh, uh, sitting around. Well, uh, law offices still may have a few books, sort of as props, uh, and there may be some books that are that are useful to have around, but. That whole business, and as I say, it was an extremely profitable business, just got destroyed by online access to the same information. Uh, and so when I look at the, at the trade publishing business today, I see the legal publishing business uh, that, uh, that I was, when I was at Lexis, I was involved in the first web-based research product that, uh, that Lexis offered to lawyers. And mm-hmm. so... You know, I just saw that completely change, and uh, it, it it's disruptive change that way. And I think I think I see the same thing happening in the traditional publishing or the the trade publishing world. Everybody said, you know, there are a few people, sort of visionaries, that say, "Oh, well, uh, traditional legal publishing is going to get destroyed by this online stuff." Mm-hmm. But nothing happens this year, and nothing happens next year, and so the people on the print side are saying, "Well." That guy was wrong. He didn't know what he was talking about. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's it's sort of like an avalanche. You mm-hmm. know, you get a few little pebbles that start going down the mountain, and then much faster than anybody expects, uh, the world changes. And uh, and I have no idea what Martindale Hubble does now. I don't know if they still have a print product at all, but uh, I watched that subsidiary of LexisNexis go from as I say, immensely profitable, just a cash machine, to laying off a whole bunch of people and trying to you know, fight for survival uh, when the online, the electronic uh, uh, copy of, uh, of Martindale Hubble and, uh, and a competitor that just sprang up, supported by another uh, big publishing company, just destroyed the financial underpinnings of that business. So I've probably gone on for too long, but disruptive change and that's we're looking at a technology disruption uh here in trade publishing it you know it really changes your life and uh nobody can predict exactly when it's going to sort of hit critical mass but it's always once it starts it always it it changes things faster than most anybody expects it to sure and i mean look at uh just mobile computing I mean, mm-hmm. two years ago, maybe there really wasn't much mobile computing going on. Now, right. if you walk into uh, an airport or a Starbucks or anything, I mean, every single person has got a computer in their pocket, or they've yep. got a tablet or an iPad or something. And uh, it was just astonishing to me how fast that penetrated uh, into the marketplace. The thing with ebooks, of course, and, you know, more and more people are telling me that. They really use their mobile technology for reading books. You know, they're not necessarily Kindle owners or Nook right. owners, but hey, they got a phone. You know, it's not mm-hmm. that bad. You can read books on your phone. Yep. And, um, you know, so uh, the thing is that a lot of these books that are selling as ebooks are basically, you know, and, and I get interested in this because um, I have a lot to do with the formatting side, but they're just plain text. You can read a biography, a memoir, a novel, a, a romance, mm-hmm. and this is the the biggest, these are the biggest sellers, so I mean there's a lot of volume there. But there are a lot of books that are just kind of don't work on right. book readers, and the technology uh, hasn't caught up there. Now, as we know in the past, you know, wherever the financial pressure is applied, that's where the, the real force of innovation goes because that's what everybody wants is some way to, to do that and then the floodgates open. But as of now, I mean, people with illustrated books or, you know, heavily formatted books or I'm doing a book right now that's like a, a textbook on uh, insurance. It's just full of graphs and charts and, you know, risk curves and all this stuff. and. It would be virtually impossible to produce this as an ebook, particularly if you had to look at it on one of those little screens. You'd never be able to see yeah. anything. So, yeah. Well, and that's and, that and you would know way more about it than I do. But the whole the whole formatting issue for anything other than straight text, you know, with all of the different devices, 
that uh, that ebooks can be can be uh, consumed on. You know, that's really tough. And I've seen some I've seen some ebooks that you know where they they tried to do some diagrams and so forth, and it just was a mess. Yeah, it's pretty uh, tough. And and so from that standpoint, you're right. There are some there are some areas that are just not useful at all but if we if we look at the uh, at the internet as an example uh, I I was an early adopter of the internet and you know it was just all text all the time you know no graphics whatsoever and uh, and uh, then the uh, first web browser came out I remember my my experience with the first web browser and all of a sudden there was a graphic here and there was a there was a picture there. It was just an extraordinary uh, uh, experience. As I say, I can still remember the first time. And, and looking back, they, you know, it was an extremely crude website. But um, well, I think I, that's really to me, David. Excuse me, but that to me sure. is what the ebook looks like now. It looks mm -hmm. like you know uh, a bare yep. bones, almost like a terminal. You know, if you remember the terminal days. Yep. Oh like, yeah. Like uh, you know, CompuServe or something like that. That's that's where it is. But you could see that. That wasn't really all that long ago. I mean, that's you know, that's not going to be forever that it's going to be like that. And eventually, you know, it's pretty obvious that a lot of everything is going to be moving to digital. So we're in kind of a strange place right now, and that uh, presents a lot of challenges for authors um, who are not that technical or not, you know, they're not in the publishing business. Maybe they have a job doing something, and they're an author on the side. You know, and all, most authors don't actually earn a lot of money from being authors per se from book sales. Oh, so you're it's kidding, quite Joel. Challenging. I, everybody knows authors are rich so. <laughs> and famous. And famous, too. That's right. <laughs> so, what about you? I mean, you're a writer. I mean, are we going to see any books from the passive voice? I mean, is there, do you have any plans of publishing anything on the publishing industry or? You know, that whole contract collection, just, you know, to somebody who's a publisher, that looks like, oh, yeah, there's a book there for sure, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my, uh, a book full of contracts. Uh, that's uh, I, only a lawyer could like that, I'm afraid. Um, I actually I actually talked about uh, a long time ago writing a book uh, taught, you know, that discussed the Kindle Direct Publishing contract. Uh, that's something that, Every indie author I know uh, uses Kindle or uses uh, uh, Amazon to publish ebooks, and they've all signed that contract. And I talked about doing an article about or doing a book about it that basically sort of goes through and says, "All right, this is what it means." Because even though it's it's fairly much in plain language, there are lots of different locations and web and and places on the Kindle. Uh, website that uh, are referenced in that contract and incorporated in that contract. And uh, I, I, I wrote about it and then I got really busy with my, uh, with my, uh, my practice representing authors and on some, on some other businesses that I'm working on on the side. Uh, and, and I let it go, but I just in the past week or two, I've, I've been thinking, you know, you need to do that and just, <laughs> just bear down, bear down and, uh, and put that together. And it's just, would sort of be a plain, plain English. Uh, this is what, this is what this really means. This is what, this is what as an author, this is what you're committing to. This is what you're supposed to get. This is what you can do if you, you know, if you, if you, if you don't do this, then you don't get paid this royalty rate. Here's how, here's the reason that, uh, that your, uh, royalty statements include a whole bunch of 35% royalty books when you thought you signed up for 70% uh, royalty all the time and sort of just basically, uh, sort of a, a walk through the contract, a, a guided tour through the contract. And so that's something I'm, as I say, I've been I've been thinking that I need to, to just break down and spend the time to uh, to put together. That would be a great service, really. I mean, I think um, people would really appreciate that, and you know, having your expert opinion on it would be uh, invaluable because also you have a way of explaining things that really connects with people. So that's great. No, thank you. And what about the blog? I mean, do you have any? Um, I, as you could tell, I'm kind of 
drawing to a close here. I don't want to take up any more of your time, but do you have any um, plans for the blog? You're just going to keep going with what you're doing, or is there anything in the uh, in the offing that we should know about? You know, uh, I'm sort of a, a an ADD kind of guy, and uh, and so uh, I wish I could, I wish I could say that I have a master plan for the past <laughs> voice, but uh, right now I, I expect I'll continue to uh, I'll con I'll continue it the way that I have been doing it in the past. Uh, it was interesting for me to see uh, my wife and I took the first vacation, first real vacation that, that uh, I've been on for two, three, maybe four years uh, earlier this summer. And I, uh, and I asked uh, some of the people who are regular, regular commenters there to take over as guest bloggers. And uh, uh, while I was, uh, while I was not going to be able to, to pay attention to the blog and I really liked some of the things they they did, and so I don't know about you know. I thought a little bit about turning it into a, a blog with guest bloggers from time to time, or probably not a group blog, um, but maybe. But that's that's pretty much just you know stuff stuff that's floated through my mind without really uh, turning into any sort of a master plan. So basically, we can look forward to more of the same great stuff that you're bringing us every day and uh, keeping us up to date on what's going on in the publishing industry and uh, inserting a little snark here or there where it's called for. Uh, so just before we end, I wonder, I mean, you know, your your wife is now an indie author, right? Right. And uh, you write about it a lot. And, you know, my uh, readers and the people watching this video are largely either authors who have already self-published or are thinking about it because that's my territory. Mm -hmm. So I just wonder, you know, from your vantage point sitting there over at the uh, Passive Voice blog, if you have any tips or suggestions or things you see that, you know, would really benefit authors thinking about going indie. Uh, number one, it's not hard. Um, it requires uh, a little bit of knowledge. It requires learning some things that you may not have done before, but you know it's not this giant difficult thing. Uh, I have a little bit of a little bit of technical aptitude, which is which has been able to to help with with my wife. But uh, you can hire somebody if you have no technical aptitude in terms of formatting it. You can hire somebody like you, Joel, to uh, to help out with you know turning your book into something that will. Uh, Will work as an ebook and work on as a print-on-demand book. Uh, and my wife's experience, and she had a very good relationship with uh, with her publisher, but she just loves being able to control everything. Mm -hmm. She actually used uh, uh, for one of her uh, for one of her indie books. She actually uh, actually hired uh, the woman that was her editor for many years with with her. Publisher to, to do some editing, and uh, and uh, Gigi, my wife, said uh, you know that after she got the uh, she got the editor's comments and changes and so forth, uh, she said the editor was shocked when the book was published a week later uh, <laughs> and available because you know as you know in you know in the traditional publisher it's sort of you know when the editor is finished you're looking at at least several months before. Uh, before anything is ready for sale, and so being able to move fast, being able to, uh, unlike with a traditional publisher, if you find you know if you find some mistakes, uh, she loves being able to fix mistakes because she you know she hates the idea of something being out there with a grammatical error or something like that, and so it's not unusual, uh, you know, after one of you know we. Her books are proofed and edited and proofed and all of that, but they go up and then she says, oh, no, I saw that there was a problem on page, you know, 213. She loves that I can fix it uh, That's brilliant, uh, really yeah. quickly. Yeah, and it was really brilliant for her to go back and hire her editor. That's really a, yeah. a great move. Yeah, well, yeah. This has been really, really interesting, David. I'm just really glad that you uh, said yes to this interview request and sat down to talk. I mean, it's just fantastic. And I really want to thank you for doing the Passive Voice blog. I mean, I read it every day, and I know thousands of other people do, and it's just a, a great resource. And that's uh, because of your uh, uh, curation and knowledge and, uh, and humor and uh, also your humanity. So 
I want to thank you for doing that, and I hope you keep doing it because we love it. Thank you so much, Joel. I've really enjoyed our conversation. Good.